You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are The Addiction Doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to this episode of The Addiction Files. We are thrilled to have Dr. Javier Ballister back joining us to talk about the neurocircuitry of addiction. This is one of my favorite topics, and but I don't know enough about it. So we are just going to talk to the expert. So Paula is going to introduce <laughs> Dr. Ballister for us. And I'm going to turn over to Paula now. Thanks. Okay. Well, for those of you who listen to the podcast, you will recognize this uh, guest. He was on episode 46 um, of season three. He was our season opener for season three, and he discussed the methamphetamine fentanyl epidemic. And honestly, it's one of our most popular episodes. So thanks again, Javier, for being on the podcast for that episode. It was so interesting, and I can see why it's one of the most popular episodes. So people are super lucky to have um, you back, and we're super lucky. And in terms of an introduction, Javier Ballester is an addiction psychiatrist, and he is the medical director of the Salt Lake City VA Substance Abuse Residential Rehabilitation Treatment Program. He was born in Zamora, Spain, and grew up in Ciudad Real. I had to practice that. I get kudos if I got it right. This is a little town in La Mancha where the Manchego cheese comes from and where the famous El Quixote book from Miguel de Cervantes takes place. That's cool. Um, He went to medical school in Madrid and he did his residency in psychiatry in Madrid as well. And then he came to the USA and did a fellowship with the Alicia Koplovich Foundation and spent two years in Pittsburgh studying child and adolescent psychiatry. Then he went and did a residency in psychiatry at Yale. And then he also did an addiction psychiatry in fellowship. So for all of you who are in residency or fellowship, don't complain because Javier has done residency and residency and fellowship and fellowship, right? That's right. You've done residency twice, fellowship twice. That's correct. So you're you're very well educated and we know that when we're when we talk to you and we're very lucky to know you um javier's interests are teaching and the applicability of neuromodulation and addiction so thanks for joining us we're very excited for this episode and uh, we're going to talk about the neurocircuitry of model of addiction with you today thank you so much both of you darlene and paula i am very excited to join you. Thank you for inviting me again. And this is one of my favorite topics. So I am going to try to do my best um, to explain some concepts here. And uh, this is a work that yeah, is never finished. It always continues moving forward and is the result of a lot of people and decades of research. Uh, So I am also very excited. I'm going to try to do my best to explain. We're excited and we we feel confident that you're going to do a good job because I've heard you lecture and so has Darlene. And so you got it. Thank you. Um, So before anything, um, I uh, recognize the work of uh, two very uh, famous uh, scientists and One of them is Nora Volkov, um, who is currently the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or uh, um, NIDA, NIDA. And she has been uh, working there since 2003. And this is the result, too, of her work uh, in the 80s and the 90s with uh, positron emission tomography, which is a neuroimaging technique in different research centers across the country. And this also, this work is also developed, was also, it's been also developed by George Coop, who um, he is the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism since 2014. And he um, described this neurocircuitry model of addiction already in a book uh, that he published back in 2006. And the title of this book is Neurobiology of Addiction, 
with another scientist called uh, Michel Lemol. And his research uh, comes from animal models of addiction, mostly with rodents. So um, we have two um, branches here. We, we have one human clinician, Nora Volkov, and then we have a basic researcher who is George Coop. And I, what, the nice thing about the neurocircuitry model of addiction is that both um, National Institute of Health institutions, uh, NIAAA and NIDA, come together uh, to explain this. And a lot of the information that I got to explain this comes from uh, two papers. One of them um, was published in 2010 in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology and is called Neurocircuitry of Addiction. And another paper uh, was published, it's kind of like an update, in 2016 in the journal Lancet Psychiatry, and it is called Neurobiology of Addiction and Neurocircuitry Analysis. So both papers provide a good summary for those uh, listeners who are more interested in, in getting more information about this. So um, the neurocircuitry model of addiction explains in general addiction um, or better, this divides the sex addiction as a multi-stage process uh, that can be divided in three different stages. And a, all of these stages uh, occur in different areas of the brain and explain different psychological phenomena too. So we can start by saying that there are three different stages. And it's important to know that not all of these, these stages are not sequential. So uh, all of them happen in more or less degree at the same time in the brain. And some people will, depending on their predisposition, some people will have um, the involvement of one of these stages um, more pronounced than other ones. Um, but um, but in summary, uh, the, the, we are dealing with three different stages. And the first one is called uh, binge intoxication. That's what they describe. And um, this information uh, for those of uh, for those of the listeners who are interested, we can find a good description of this stage on a paper called The Brain on Drugs from Reward to Addiction that was published in 2015 in the journal Cell. And this is the result of uh, Nora Volkov and Maricela Morales. And what this stage uh, summarizes is, um, I'm gonna start to provide a little bit of basic information. And it is important to first uh, highlight that in order for any substance to produce or to have the propensity to produce addiction, all of the drugs uh, must increase the levels of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And that happens well directly or indirectly, but the ultimate road needs to be the increase on dopamine. And um, dopamine is a neurotransmitter or other people even consider that it is a neuromodulator uh, because it doesn't work fast, it works slowly. And it is a, it is a neurotransmitter that uh, is involved in a lot of functions in the brain. So it is is very much involved in movement, regulation of movement. And, and it is, uh, as a consequence, when it is deficit, it, it can produce a disease called Parkinson's disease. Uh, but it is also involved in motivational processes. And this is coming from a different route in the brain. Um, so the main neurons uh, that uh, produce dopamine that are involved when the dopamine is involved in these motivational processes and reward processes, the neurons come from an area of the midbrain called ventral tegmental area. And so this area has uh, the, the sum of those neurons uh, project to different brain regions. And these regions are important for um, 
some very important processes such as motivation, like I said, but also emotion regulation, attention, and, and cognitive control. So they project to different areas of the brain from the ventral tegmental area, and those areas uh, could, uh, those uh, examples of those areas are the basal ganglia, um, the amygdala, or the prefrontal cortex. And this is through a pathway called mesocorticolimbic. It has like a long name. Uh, but it's basically uh, depending on the on the psychological function that we are considering, um, uh, the neurons are projecting to different brains. So dopamine is released in two different ways in the brain. There is a tonic way, which means that it's constantly released. And there is also another way that is called phasic. Um, the tonic way is between one to eight hertz. hertz. Um, so it's one to two, one to eight times a second. And the phasic way is more than 15 hertz. So it's produced more than 15 times a second. And the difference between both is that the phasic way produces high increases in dopamine in the synaptic in the synaptic space. And the synaptic space is that space by which two neurons communicate one to each other. It is thought that this phasic way is in charge of signaling those stimuli associated with rewards. And this is called conditioned stimuli. So uh, for those people who don't know, conditioned stimuli, when, uh, when we talk about this, we can think about the classic experiments of, of Pavlov and the bell and the dog. And we can, the bell in this case uh, is a conditioned stimulo, stimuli uh, because the, the noise of the bell was paired to the delivery of food. So the dog started to salivate as soon as the dog could hear the sound of the bell. So uh, that is a conditioned stimuli. And the phasic, um, fast release of dopamine is involved in signaling those stimuli. So all of this was discovered by a scientist called um, Dr. Uh, Saltz, um, or Wolfram Saltz, at the beginning of the 90s. And this was synthesized in and first published in a journal in the prestigious journal Science in 1997 uh, on a paper called A Neural Substrate of Prediction and Reward. And what this scientist did is he placed, he was placed electrodes in the brain of monkeys and he could measure um, in vivo the release of dopamine by something called microdialysis. So basically measuring the concentrations of dopamine in the synaptic areas uh, of the brain. And he was able to demonstrate that the levels of dopamine in, and in monkeys will increase when, uh, when there was a stimuli that would predict the um, delivery of a reward. And he called this that um, um, a signal prediction um, and this is very contrarily to uh, um, what a lot of people think that out there, uh, people normally um, think that dopamine is involved in, in pleasure and it is somehow too involved in pleasure. But it's not only on that, um, dopamine is also uh, involved in all of these uh, all of these uh, stimuli, all of these conditioned uh, stimuli, and especially those that are important for the survival of um, organism. So, for example, the availability of food or uh, sex, all of, all of that increases the levels of dopamine. Also, when there is a delivery of an unexpected reward, that also increases the levels of dopamine, with the idea that that new stimuli will be paired in the future and will become predictive of a further delivery in the future. So interesting. So it's really an anticipatory 
neuromodulator or neurotransmitter. And then it's also, so it's and, and a learning and motivation it's, neurotransmitter, right? As opposed to what we simply and historically have thought about it as just pleasure. It's not only pleasure, it's more anticipation and learning. Exactly. That is a very important thing to know because dopamine is uh, is very much involved in learning and in and it is very much essential and central in some processes called um, long term potentiation and which are processes that are involved in plasticity on the in the neurons. So through dopamine, um, there there is. Uh, new new connections and long term connections between neurons um, are going to be facilitated through this process called long term potentiation. Like I said before, all of all drugs of abuse uh, they need to increase the levels of dopamine, and if if there is no such a thing, then then the drug then there is no drug of abuse. There is no possibility for that. That is why not every substance in the world can become a drug of abuse. Uh, it has to have that basic um, uh, property. And the interesting thing to know is that uh, drugs uh, increase the levels of dopamine um, quantitatively in hundreds or even thousands of times higher than the natural rewards produce. So as we can imagine, there is going to be a very, very deep process of learning that will be ingrained for uh, many, many years. And that is one of the problems of addiction. And that is one of the problems, too, that explain why people uh, can suffer from return to use after decades even of becoming sober because those circuits have been so ingrained by dopamine and other neurotransmitters that uh, uh, that are there connected um, um, reinforced should i continue <laughs> yeah yeah no that's okay. really interesting Okay, I'm gonna try. I'm trying to make it a little, a little, uh, uh, like if there is anything that it doesn't, you know, I'm trying to make it understandable. Um, okay, so no, another uh, to make it a little more complicated, um, the the ways for which um, dopamine uh, works in the brain, in the basal ganglia, in this area of the brain called basal ganglia, there are two different pathways uh, by which dopamine works. One of them is called direct pathway and another one is called indirect pathway. And this is very well described, um, the control of movements. This is something that we had to study when we went to medical school to try to understand what happens when there is a degeneration of the dopaminergic projections, in this case, from the substantia nigra to the dorsal uh, basal ganglia. Um, but um, uh, it happens that these both pathways, direct and indirect pathways, are also involved in the circuits of motivation that I am trying to explain. So it's not only about movement, it's also about other processes. In this case, through this mesocortical limbic pathway coming from the ventral tegmental area. So the possibility or the um, classification of direct or indirect pathway has to do with the presence of two different types of receptors. So receptors are those places where dopamine works in the neurons. So there are two different families of receptors. There is one family called D1 or D1-like, and there is another one called D2 or D2-like. And D2 family of dopamine receptors works um, are involved in indirect in the indirect pathway, and D1 type receptors are involved in the direct pathway. And it is thought that the direct pathway is involved more in the in this expectation of reward, while the indirect pathway is more involved in punishment and in um, um, and it is important then to know that um, both 
D1 are excitatory receptors and D2 are inhibitory receptors. And D1 receptors have very low affinity for dopamine. So they will only be activated when there is enough increase. When I was talking before about this phasic increase in dopamine levels, that phasic increase is large enough to activate this D1 direct pathway, and that is associated to reward. When the dopamine is released in toni tonically, more in a constant way, then uh, it can bind to the D2-like receptors. And these receptors have a lot of affinity for dopamine. It is not like the D1. And that's why when there is not enough uh, dopamine or when it is released tonically, only the D2 or indirect pathway will be activated. And people might think, okay, well, if this is involved in punishment, how is it possible that tonically this punishment is involved, right? So, but what I, but it's important to know that D2 are inhibitory. So when the um, regular baseline motivational processes, the D2 indirect avoiding punishment, it is what it is activated. And that is what explains our basic uh, motivational processes. I don't know if that's clear. Maybe, Javier, just for our non-medical listeners, explain the difference between like excitatory and inhibitory. Okay. Like, yeah. Like, so what, what does yeah. that mean? That's important. Yes. Thank you for, for reminding me. So something excitatory means that the neurons where the dopamine are, uh, is binding to, those neurons are going to be activated. So are going to start to fire and they are going to start to um, basically fire. So, so in order for people to understand, while inhibitory, what, it, what it's going to do is going to produce changes that is going to lead to those neurons not to fire, not to be activated. So that's the difference between something excitatory or inhibitory in the brain. So imagine like a um, like electricity going through uh, cords. So, so something if you if you if you bind two pieces of cord, you if it's excitatory, you are going to have electricity. But if one of them is inhibitory, you are not going to have electricity. So it's basically something like that. That's great. That really helps. Thank um, a couple of more things to know about this binge intoxication stage is that like i said is is this is happening in an area called the basal ganglia and that is uh like in the middle um of the of the brain deep deep structures in the middle of the brain and and um one important thing to know is that those changes like i said before in dopamine are gonna be long lasting uh, by those processes that I said before that are very important in learning called long-term potentiation. So um, when we also talked before about dopamine being involved in pleasure or, or not, we it's very important that we, we have to mention um, two scientists that have been working on this at the University of uh, Michigan. They are called Robinson and Berich, and they published in 1993 a theory called incentive sensitization. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds a little complicated, but it's not really. Um, what it means is that um, um, those stimuli that I was talking before that have predictive value, signaling um, a reward, they ultimately because there is so much dopamine, because they are being activated so many times, they become sensitized, those stimuli, meaning that they will have more powerful to act to signal the prediction of the reward. But more interestingly is that those stimuli can become attractive by itself. So the only, the, the mere presence of this stimuli can be rewarding for some people, not as much as the drug per se, but even just the stimuli. And that's why it's called incentive sensitization because the stimuli becomes sensitized, but also it becomes incentivized. So that's what the, the theory tries to explain. 
And this is a very good theory because it also works explaining uh, why on uh, uh, some addictions that are not where um, drugs are not uh, typically involved. So I'm just talking more about gambling disorder. Uh, it explains why uh, in gambling disorder you have it has been demonstrated that you have alterations in dopaminergic circuits, and it helps to explain uh, how you can become addicted to those powerful stimuli that are environmental without even the need to use a substance to increase the levels of dopamine. So interesting, especially since recently we've had a guest just you know discussing um, porn and sex addiction, and another guest, um, Dr. Medica Canabar, discussing addictions of gaming and gambling and phone. And then another guest, uh, Catherine Van Tassel, about food addiction. I mean, food, I guess, is somewhat mixed because it's also a chemical in a lot of ways. But those other process addictions, this explains the process addictions, right, that Dr. Alex Katahakis and and Dr. Canabar talk about. So that's fascinating. And, yeah, and these incentive sensitization also helps to explain why uh, stressful stressful situations might lead to a return to use in the drug because uh, we we know now that stress is related to with increases in dopamine too so if you have already something that is sensitized you might activate the whole circuit just by stressful situations so in that regards i think that this theory helps explain these concepts too very well finally can, um, wait sorry also, javier can you can you just talk about that a little bit more? Because this is really important. So, because so many people return to use under stress, right? Like, I'm amazed sitting in clinic in all of January, and I know you and Darlene are hearing the same thing. We're hearing lots of people talk about how December was so stressful and the holidays, and a lot of people had a return or an increase in use. And also, you know, the stressors of a cold, cold winter. So can can you explain it one more time? <laughs> explain yes. it to me. So uh, stress is one of the most powerful reasons why many people return to use drugs. And um, I'm going to be talking now in a few minutes about the next stage that can explain this very well called withdrawal negative affect. But it is also important, at least from this um, binge intoxication stage through the incentive sensitization theory, um, we already, we know that stress produces increases in dopamine. This is another argument why to consider and to take into account that dopamine is not only about pleasure, it's more about marking important things for survival. So uh, it has been proven many times that in even in animal models, that when you expose an animal to a very stressful situation, uh, for example, the presence of a predator in an animal like a goat, you can. Um, it has been demonstrated that stressful hormones increase in those situations, of course, but it has also been demonstrated how animals can return to use drugs under those stressful situations and that can be explained by many reasons and one of them is through this incentive sensitization but another reason is going to be now uh when i talk about the withdrawal negative affect stage so the last important piece that i wanted to talk is that uh, there has also been another recent um uh, not so recent, but recent discovery uh, uh, is that, um, and I'm talking about this stage, is that the uh, ventral tegmental area, this area of the brain of the um, almost at the top of the brain stem and the floor of the uh, diencephalon. So this area um, is involved, the ventral tegmental area is under control somehow um, of also among different different areas is under control by the prefrontal cortex through uh, different projections of the prefrontal cortex, uh, glutamatergic projections. But um, one of the things that uh, people, uh, more basic researchers, they have been able to find is that through the development of addiction, um, there uh, when dopamine is involved more and more, there is a transition uh, between a more um, 
let's say, uh, controlled way of using drugs to a more habit or automatic way of using drugs. And it has been demonstrated that this is also through dopamine, but there is a transition and the areas that are activated, uh, it goes from the ventral tegmental area to the substantia nigra, which is an area that is involved in movements and that is not under prefrontal cortex uh, modulation. So that so this is kind of like a neuroscientific evidence to explain why in the long-term effects uh, of addiction, a lot of people end up using drugs in a more compulsive uh, way. So they say it transitions from a more impulsive to a more compulsive way. So it becomes more habit ingrained, it becomes more automatic. And one of the theories is that there has been a transition in the dopaminergic pathways from a more ventral tegmental area, which is the normal way uh, of motivation, to a substantia nigra, which is more um, uh, um, movement type and less under control. And that goes also from the ventral part of the basal ganglia to a more dorsal part that is more involved in habits. That is so interesting. And I think we could all say, you hear that in our patients' histories, don't you think? Because they'll come in and they'll tell you that they don't even remember or know what they're doing. It's just, it's like you just said, Javier, like it, they're just, it's almost that automatic behavior and they don't even know what's happening. But that makes total sense the way you're explaining that what's going on in their brain. Yes, they might even have problems identifying that that is, uh, this is um, something that we will talk at the end, but they might even have problems identifying that they, that is becoming even a problem. So it is just, it gets, yes. it, it, it gets worse. It gets more uh, out of our own even awareness of this is a problem. Um, so I think that this is an important concept, and I am. Um, uh, I was very surprised when I learned uh, these these findings that how addiction can become more compulsive and more automatic, and and possibly then less responsive to treatments um, uh, in the long term. I find that so fascinating. I, I mean, and it it just kind of makes sense with what we see. Um, so. Maybe we can now move on to the next stage. Uh, it's called withdrawal negative affect. And that's the second stage. And um, the first stage, Dr. Volkov is more, um, provided more input and more information. This second stage, Dr. Kub provides and has more data and more information. It's kind of like his area of expertise. And, um, it is very important to know that uh, this stage happens. We are moving away from this uh, basal ganglia part, and now we are moving away to another area of the brain called extended amygdala. And this area um, is, um, if we think about the basal ganglia more in the middle part and, and deep part of the brain, this is moving a little bit more to the uh, lateral, so more to the temporal areas um, of the brain. And it's very hard to explain without a picture. So I, I encourage everyone to look into any of these papers that I mentioned before, and they can see where it is located at. And this is a, uh, this stage helps to explain why um, a lot of people uh, uh, use drugs, not only due to a positive reinforcement, which the previous stage helps very well to explain that. But also uh, a lot of people use drugs because they wanna feel relief from negative emotions or from stress. And that is what is called negative reinforcement. So positive reinforcement in classic psychology is kind of like when you get a reward and you work hard to get that reward, that uh, work gets um, reinforced, and that is called positive reinforcement. But there is also another side of reinforcement that is called negative reinforcement. And what that explains is you work to get away from uh, um, uh, from 
to, to get away from a situation so people can understand from an undesirable situation. So in this case, uh, from withdrawal symptoms. So a lot of people uh, use drugs and ultimately we could even say that uh, the majority, if not all of the people who become addicted to drugs will end up using drugs to escape from this emotional affect, emotional stage. And um, it's not as much as trying to get um, any reward from them or trying to get this high that was more associated with maybe the very beginning of the first stage, uh, but it's more about not feeling miserable. And I think this stage applies to a lot of the drugs uh, that are more what people call downers. So um, opioids, alcohol, benzodiazepines, those drugs are very, very well uh, associated with this stage when the drugs are not present anymore. But ultimately all of them, but this especially to me is very much more applicable to the downers than, than the other ones. Uh, George Coop talks about um, a classical theory, a, class, a classical uh, process called, and he wants to differentiate between homeostasis and allostasis. This is a little difficult to explain, but I'm going to try to do my best. So in our, our bodies, um, we have a lot of processes there that are very primitive. And uh, we need, um, there are a lot of uh, processes in place uh, uh, so to maintain an equilibrium um, in the body uh, for essential survival uh, functions. For, for example, uh, when the oxygen levels drop, um, then the body's response is trying to improve and trying to activate breathing so you can breathe faster or even deeper so you can get the oxygen up again. The same thing happens with other processes that need to have an equilibrium, like for example, pH, the pH in blood. Uh, our, our, uh, we need to have a con um, um, constant pH in our blood because otherwise the main chemical reactions will not take place. And so we, that needs to be very tightly regulated. And there is a lot of chemical, they called uh, uh, buffers, that are activated uh, when, when the pH gets uh, deviated. So all of this is called, uh, all of this is explained through homeostasis and homeostatic mechanisms. And they, they basically work through feedback. So there is a sensor that uh, in the body that notices that there is a deviation on the, um, on the, um, equilibrium and what that happens is like a danger signal and then this buffer and these uh, systems start to get activated to reach back this homeostasis. So this is this is called homeostasis. But there is also another process that is also regulation and it's also equilibrium but in a different way and that is called allostasis and it's different from homeostasis for two reasons. One, because it requires changes in the body to continue the equilibrium. And so people can understand this. Uh, for example, when you have people exercising and you have, let's say, lifting weights, your muscles are going to get bigger. And that is because the body senses that there is a perturbation and there uh, that you require more strength to deal with your environment and as a consequence your muscles get bigger so um you still want to get an equilibrium but you do the equilibrium you maintain the equilibrium through changes so that is the main difference between homeo and allostasis in this case and allostasis is not as much as feedback but it's more about fit forward mechanisms. And um, well, it's important to know that in, in our brains, most uh, when we talk about learning and about changes, most of the things that happen in the brain are allostasis because uh, we are always, uh, I mean, we are never the same. I am, I, you know, we are not the same as when, when we were children. And every day we could argue that we are a little bit different because something has been changing in our brains and we are not exactly the same molecules that we were the day before, right? So this is through processes of allostasis.
So uh, why do we, why would, do we talk about this? Is um, because when um, uh, people, it's important for people to know that the use of drugs is actually something very stressful for the brain, and um, that is because drugs are gonna lead to uh, a lot of changes happening. So. Uh, one of the things when I was talking about the dopamine levels, when I said what I said before is that the increases on dopamine levels produced by drugs are in the order of hundreds or thousand times bigger than the nature than the nature will produce, and so that is perceived as a complete abnormality um, in the brain. It's something that is not normal. It's a total perturbation of what is supposed to happen. Um, so that is going to activate these um, allostatic mechanisms. And this, uh, th uh, this theory, it was proposed by uh, Dr. Solomon already in the 70s, uh, is used by George Coop um, to explain why the use of drugs in general leads to changes in the brain and to perturbations called uh, process B, wh whatever. But it's important to know that uh, uh, George Coop distinguishes between changes in the brain produced by the use of drugs. Um, and that can explain, um, and he differentiates two types. Within system changes and between. Within system changes are those changes that are produced in the dopamine pathways that I explained before. So what happens is that um, uh, the levels of dopamine get so high that th there is going to be changes in those D1 or D2 receptors in the neurons. So there is going to be changes so the neurons don't get as much or as less uh, stimulated by this. So there is going to be ch changes in the number of receptors um, available. So in other words, is the development of tolerance. And this can be very well explained uh, by the use of drugs and explains why when we are using uh, drugs, um, the same levels, the same amount of drugs do not produce the same changes anymore. You need to use higher and higher uh, doses to get the same degree of activation that you used to get uh, before. This has been demonstrated in animals and in humans. And in this case, in neuroimaging studies in humans, they have been able to demonstrate that when people have are having withdrawal symptoms to drugs, or even in that stage that you have talked before called protracted withdrawal, if they give a substance in those subjects, um, a substance like uh, methylphenidate, which is a release, it releases dopamine under normal circumstances, they have been able to find on people with cocaine use disorder, but also with alcohol use disorder, that the levels of dopamine that methylphenidate can produce is lower when they are having protracted withdrawal. And how is this possible? But it is because there has been this within system changes. So the levels of dopamine are not as high as they should be before. So uh, this has been demonstrated, like I said, in, in animals and in humans. And Javier, I have a question. Yeah. How long does that last? For, does it last for ho however long the protracted withdrawal is being experienced, or does it go on even beyond that? I would say that uh, definitely um, during this protracted withdrawal symptom, so it might be def at minimum it's going to be days, if not weeks, but um, you know, it might be those changes in the dopamine levels might last for months. And that is going to be, uh, that has been shown in different neuroimaging studies. And that is going to depend on uh, individual reasons and the amount of drug that has been used for how long the drug has been used. So there is a lot of biological factors that explain these lower levels of dopamine than people uh, that people are going to have. And the clinical, the clinical uh, um, uh, consequence of this is to explain this uh, lack of motivation that people suffer with when they are withdrawing and um, when they even stop using drugs. So the levels of dopamine used to be so high in the past that now natural rewards are not going to produce the same. So people feel like this blah, this feeling that things are not as good as they used to be. That is called anhedonia, 
um, or hypoidonia. And, um, and basically it's that, that, that natural rewards are not stimu as stimulating as they used to be before the development of addiction. Um, so this is the within system changes. And there is also uh, a between system changes. And this is where the extended amygdala uh, uh, plays a role. So uh, like I said, the drug use is stressful for the brain. So this is going to lead to uh, any drug, any drug in general. And there is a lot of research in that area because there might be even um, um, immunological reasons why there is release of stress hormones in the brain. But um, drug use leads to increase in stress hormones such as CRF and other stress hormones that are normally involved um, uh, in stressful situations. So um, there has been, it has been demonstrated that um, uh, the chronic use of drugs is gonna lead to increases in CRF in areas such as the amygdala. So, and extended amygdala. And so what happens is that the extended amygdala is a very well, is very well positioned in the brain and it connects to areas of reward, but it also connects to autonomic areas that are responsive to things like heart rate control, like um, blood pressure control. And so all of these stressful situations are gonna lead to even, and, and it has also been proven that the withdrawal from drugs in general, especially the downers, there is, you know, the, amyg the extended amygdala starts to fire up and, and produces or explains some of these withdrawal symptoms that people suffer with when they are when they stop to use the the normal the regular drug that they used to they used to so this between system changes can explain very well this self medication hypothesis of why people use drugs when they are under stressful situations because they are trying to modulate and to tamper down this extended amygdala overactivation. And I think that this is also important to know because um, the, this area of the brain can also be activated uh, by many other things. So uh, for example, past trauma uh, has been proven uh, uh, to sensitize this area of the brain and to become more responsive. But, uh, you know, and other things like um, longitudinal experiences and neglect and genetic influences can explain why people are more reactive. Some people are more reactive um, in the extended amygdala than um, others. And this is also why, well, I don't know if this is why maybe you can answer, but why finding now that medications which tend to calm down the extended amygdala response on the autonomic nervous system may be helpful for people in protracted withdrawal. So we're using more medications like alpha adrenergic agonists like clonidine and prazosin and things like that, not specifically because we need them to have blood pressure lowering, but just because it helps with that effect, do you think this is why? That is very true. And and uh, there is a, a, a communication, bidirectional communication between these autonomic centers and the amygdala. So that might explain on things like alcohol use disorder, there might be positive effects of using things like prasosin, which is a drug that is normally for, um, it used to be used in the past for uh Low pressure control, but not anymore. But um, why prasosin can um, uh, improve symptoms in things like alcohol use disorder that has nothing. Well, it has actually something to do with blood pressure regulation because we know also when people uh, have an alcohol use disorder, especially if they are in withdrawal, the blood pressure is going to be all over the place. But um, but it's not only about autonomic; it's also about the feeling and about the stress and. Um, we, for example, we know that on people with post-traumatic stress disorder, they can get some relief by drugs such as prasosin. And that is, is thought that prasosin kind of like tempered down 
this hyperactivation of the amygdala, and that can lead to have less activating dreams uh, than uh, they would. Um, so we talk about CRF, which is one of these uh, hormones that is involved in stress and um, is involved in the release of cortisol, but there is other neurotransmitters that are important. So for example, there is one called dynorphin, and, and this this neurotransmitter uh, is expressed in different areas um, of the brain and it has been found that is increased, um, the levels are increased in after chronic drug of use such as uh, cocaine. And what it does is decreases the activity of the dopaminergic projections through a different type of receptors. And um, there is other, um, I, we talk about these stress hormones, but there is also, to make it more interesting, there is an anti-stress system in the brain. So there are, we are equipped to also have anti-stress uh, when we were talking about buffers before um, in the brain. So this is through some neurotransmitters, um, peptides called, for example, neuropeptide Y, uh, but also endocannabinoids or nociceptin those are um, mechanisms in place to try to regulate um, stressful or high stressful um, states in the brain. Conclusion, um, um, just to summarize this negative affect uh, stage, um, the, we can say that the development of these aversive emotional states um, uh, can lead to continued drug use. And this could be the result of an increase in these stress systems, like I said before, like CRF in the amygdala, uh, or anti-reward systems like dynorphin, like that I explained before, just uh, br very briefly with cocaine. But it could also be by deficits in the anti-stress systems, like deficits in endocannabinoids or neuropeptide Y. So that explains also, well, this is complicated, but that explains how people can have alterations in this stage through different pathways. And finally, uh -huh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, thank you. That was really helpful. So the last stage is called preoccupation anticipation stage. And that stage, um, 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 uh, is focused in those changes and the role that the prefrontal cortex has in the development of addiction. The prefrontal cortex of people know is an area of uh, the frontal cortex that is behind our foreheads and above the eyes. And it is a very important area because it's involved in many functions that are essential for our own uh, functioning. So self-control, emotional regulation, motivation, attention, working memory, decision-making, salience attribution. So all of that is prefrontal cortex has a major role there. So in 2001, um, Rita Goldstein and Nora Volkov, they proposed a syndrome, they proposed a, a, a complicated name for a syndrome um, that might explain what happens in addiction in the prefrontal cortex. And they called that syndrome um, impair response inhibition and salience attribution. Right. Uh, so basically what happens is that because of those changes that happen in the prefrontal cortex, there is going to be a bias and the prefrontal cortex is going to be more interested, let's say, in, and it's going to give excessive importance or excessive salience to drugs and drug-related cues, and as a consequence, decrease sensitivity to non-drug reinforcings. But also, at the same time, there is going to be an impairment in the ability to inhibit those behaviors that are not good for us. So that is what the impair response in inhibition and salience attribution tries to explain. So... Um, br very briefly, um, uh, different neuroimaging studies have demonstrated that there are two networks in the prefrontal cortex important for addiction. One of the net networks is called the dorsal network, and it's in, you know there are areas there like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or the dorsal uh, the dorsal part of the anterior cingulate cortex or even like the inferior frontal gyrus, but that's less important. But uh, that network, what is important to know is that that network, network is involved in uh, higher order, um, what they call higher order 
uh, cognitive function. So basically things like inhibition of maladaptive uh, responses and emotion regulation. So kind of like in, in one of the uh, functions will be to try to uh, let us be less impulsive. So we can inhibit those responses that are not Pro, uh, pro, pro, you know, uh, in our own advantage. Uh, the other uh, network that the neuroimaging studies have uh, demonstrated is called ventral network, and that has areas such as the medial orbitofrontal cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and the ventral anterior cingulate cortex. And this last network um, would be involved in automatic processes, emotion-related processes, such as salience attribution, which is like us giving importance to things, right? That are important. So uh, what these uh, researchers uh, talk about is that in a healthy brain, um, uh, the non-drug related functions and emotions uh, in general predominate and the automatic responses to drugs are suppressed. That's what uh, a healthy brain would do. So, um, uh, for example, if a person is exposed to drugs and there is no intention to use drugs, for example, because there is going to be ad adverse consequences to the use of those drugs, like let's say if I if I get drunk tomorrow, I'm not going to be able to go to work, so I'm not going to go and, and get drunk then, um, then there is a stop signal, what they call a stop signal, and that is basically uh, from both places. So there will be uh, the dorsal network, is involved in the ventral network and is saying, hey, stop there. Don't use drugs, don't use alcohol or do whatever because tomorrow you're gonna have problems. So don't do that. And, um, and in an addictive brain, however, especially during craving or during withdrawal, um, all these thoughts that are related to the use of drugs at the expense of non-drug thoughts are going to pred pred predominate. And what, what neuroimaging has shown is that the ventral network becomes more activated and more powerful and not so much the dorsal network. So especially when people are exposed to stimuli or to drug cues, these areas are different. So the ventral area is going to be very activated and, and, and some people even relate that to the uh, experience of cravings. And the dorsal area, however, is going to be uh, inhibited. So what these researchers say is that the stop signal that I spoke before about, uh, that I talk about is compromised. And there is instead a behavior that is called go, but go with a, with a uh, interrogation. It's a go behavior, kind of like, should I do it? Um, that is what is gonna predominate. And during intoxication, so when there is active use of drugs, um, there is a complete interruption of this dorsal network and the ventral network takes over. So there is not only a go with an interrogation, in this, in this case, there is a go with an exclamation. So, so it's not about go, but it's more about go. <laughs> so do, do it. So um, the, the drug related stimuli becomes then almost the only thing that the brain is thinking about at that time. So this has been shown in people uh, uh, um, with uh, fMRI studies, like I said before. So um, these areas, people with addictions, uh, it has been shown that these areas, when they are not using actively drugs, when they are like in sobriety, uh, but soon after in this protracted withdrawal, um, uh, these areas like the ventral network is going to be lighting up when exposed to drug cues and, and that has been correlated with craving measures. But this is very interesting. That was even correlated with the drug use three months later. So the, the lighting up of these areas might even predict why some people will be using drugs later in the future. Again, this is just correlation. This is not a, a definitive uh, thing that is going to happen. Um, so another study also in people on early abstinence um, showed in this case, some people with cocaine use disorder showed that a non-drug stimuli that are very powerful for all of us or for anyone such as money is not gonna lead to the same level of activation than controls. So it's kind of like their brain has become desensitized 
to to in this case to money and to normal like rewards um another study for example using iv cocaine in people with cocaine use disorder this is very interesting it showed an improvement in this um, um inhibit in, in inhibitory control done by different tasks and there was kind of like a normalization in how these areas work when people were actively using so it's kind of like then uh, people sometimes might be using so they can normalize the the way that the brain used to work before in this case the prefrontal cortex. so okay let me make sure i'm understanding that so when they're actively using so they they are not having that high that vta isn't hijacking the prefrontal cortex basically Am I understanding that right? So one of the uh, things that they have, uh, and this is kind of like a connection with the first stage, is that those changes that I that I explained before in the dopamine receptors mm -hmm. have been correlated with the degree of activation of the prefrontal cortex. So um, for whatever, for one reason or another reason, the prefrontal cortex is not going to be working the same as it used to be before. So um, that has been proven in uh, people um, when they are not using, but they are having protracted withdrawal symptoms, maybe, or in early abstinence, they can see that natural rewards do not activate those areas of the brain. However, um, condition stimuli or stimuli associated with drugs will activate the ventral network in a way, in in a in an excessive way that not healthy controls would would uh, have and it will how and the dorsal network that i explained before is not going to be working um so um so it, it it tries to um explain why under normal circumstances it's very difficult for people with addiction to regulate their habits and the use of drugs because their prefrontal cortexes are not working as they used to work before inhibiting um um automatic responses and probably even planning for the future mm -hmm. it's just completely offline is how we've described that yeah yeah and the last the very last thing to understand in this process is that there has been changes not only in the prefrontal cortex but also um uh, in areas uh, which are, are very connected to the prefrontal cortex, such as the insula. So the insula is an area that we have in the brain that is very much involved in um, the uh, um, de uh, detection of uh, integration and detection of autonomic visceral inform information, but also with insight. So what you feel inside, and it's very much also involved in uh, insight and uh, realizing and perceiving emotions too. So not only these prefrontal cortex areas that I explained before, but also the insula suffers from changes. And that might also explain why um, uh, people with addiction, especially in the later, later on, they have a problem uh, identifying the consequences of their behaviors. So they cannot have the insight into what's happening to them. So some people even call that uh, like a nosognosia or, or um, uh, difficulties identifying the disease. So a lot of people with uh, addiction end up even, uh, they, they, you know, they, we know that people with addiction, they don't learn from punishment because they cannot even identify that that is even going to be a problem. So you are going to be incarcerated if you do this. And it's like, you know, they cannot even even perceive that that is going to be an adverse consequence. So so it, it, it's a very interesting that's, that's, mechanistic way and, yeah. um, and, and controversial because, of course, like we will have then some debate about what is free will and where is free will at. And that is another more uh, philosophical uh, um, conversation, I think. But that is a really, really fascinating concept, Javier, because I think we see we see this all the time with our patients where we don't we don't understand when particularly when it's causing devastating effects on their health. It's not just the legal consequences that we see over and over again with our patients, but the physical consequences. And you just keep thinking, why do you keep doing this? But it's like you said, they just, they, that, that concept is just their brain. And it's not, it's not computing 
this is not even making sense to them. So that's really mm-hmm. fascinating. Yeah, that's a very, very... I think, yeah, I think that's good for us to understand. Yeah, that can be, and of course, this is, is this is a matter. It's, it's not an all or nothing. There are different degrees of insight. There are different degrees of understanding. So it's a very, very complicated. But at least it helps us to understand that those things that we see in people are actually happening in the in their brains. So it is happening in in an organ of the body. And I think that is a very important uh, thing for us to to understand. I think that can also help the stigmatize, stigmatizing a lot of um, um, guilt that is associated with addiction um, in general. I think that a different discussion is the you know should people have adverse consequences for their drug use or not? You know, as, so then we get into a more philosophical discussion about um, society rules and all of that. That I'm not talking about any of this. That's a different philosophical. I just also want to know to let everyone know that uh, we are not only biology, but we are also um, uh, so we are biology, but humans are not only biology. I mean, they are also a product of culture, a product of development, a product of um, uh, philosophy. So th- there is, uh, there is, we are more complicated than a just single explanation about everything that happens. Yes, that's I a think, really good statement. Yeah, that is. That's really important because we see people who beat science all the time or they kind of defy the odds. And you talk to people with lived experience and in recovery and you know, they they see their addiction in spite of all these neurochemical changes and challenges that they've experienced during their u- period of use. They've been able to emerge out of it completely. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I think there's always hope for people, even in spite of genetics, in spite of trauma and adverse mm-hmm. child events and ongoing, even co-occurring mental illness. Mm-hmm. I just I think we always instill hope that people can get better in spite of all these changes. But I remember being so mm-hmm. upset during lectures and addiction medicine, um, you know, conversations in fellowship because you just feel, oh my gosh, what's the chances that anyone's ever going to get yeah. able to achieve their goal? <laughs> you know, like with mm-hmm. Tiffany Love, she would give a lecture and I'd be like, there's no way anyone has a <laughs> chance. Well, I think that science helps us to understand many things because it definitely helps understanding the development of addiction. But there is also a neuroscience of recovery. And science also explains those changes that happen in the brain when people get sobriety. And like you just said before, uh, Paula, um, we never know and when uh, when someone is gonna click. And we have, all of us have seen samples of people who are doing very poorly year after year and then suddenly one time is the time and then they stop using i think that is the magic of our profession and that is something that even science cannot predict so i think that's what it makes us humans and and i think that is what makes things interesting and always possible love it absolutely <laughs> but i think okay but i think it's so important javier to have these lessons from you and to understand the science because we just don't come to people who are struggling with, you know, compulsive substance use and alcohol use and expect them to just change even when they want to, you know, Mm -hmm. people desperately want to change and it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. And this gives us a framework to understand why it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important Mm -hmm. to understand the neurochemistry and even for people you know, family members, community members, people who are not in medicine to understand that this is mm-hmm. really, like Dr. Volkow says, this is a brain condition. And it doesn't mm-hmm. mean it can't be, you know, resolved, but it mm-hmm. really is more than just n- not wanting to be better or wanting to change. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it's also important to know that the brain is very plastic and it has been demonstrated over and over that uh, intervention, psychotherapy, sobriety, medications, uh, rehabilitation, all of that produces also changes in the brain. So in the same way that, that drugs produce changes in the brain, uh, recovery it also produces changes in the brain. So um, science does not provide a mechanistic, unavoidable, uh, almost uh, impossible um, 
um, way uh, that addiction is going to happen. So, so that's it. You have nothing to do. I don't think. I don't think no one who is serious in science would say that. Uh, but um, but I think that it at least helps us to understand why things are way more complicated and things like you have to uh, do your part and this is a moral failure and all of that. I think that science helps to at least. Um, uh, erase those concepts that have been so um, um, negative for generations and centuries of people suffering from addiction almost in the whole human history. So I think that is one of the things that science can uh, give us and teaches us and what I find very fascinating. I love it. Yeah. Yes. That is, and we could continue talking. Yeah. I love it. So just recapping so, uh, so i think the conclusion of the neurocircuitry model of addiction is that addiction is a multi-stage process that happens in different parts of the brain and is a problem of uh, and dopamine and um, kind of like more uh, incentive problem and, and positive reinforcement and that is explained by the binge intoxication stage that happens in the basal ganglia but addiction is also about a uh, uh, desire to um, um, uh, get away from all of the negative aspects that brings with it and what what George Cook calls uh, the um, dark side of addiction. So uh, it's also uh, an, a stressful condition that also involves changes in the brain, in this case, in the extended amygdala, and that explains um, all these uh, uh, negative reinforcement processes. And, and also addiction is a problem of control. It's a problem of craving, it's a problem of inhibition, mm -hmm. and it's a problem of regulation. And that can be explained very broadly by changes in the prefrontal cortex within this anticipation stage. So kind of like what we see in clinical work is what we see in the brain. And I like the neurocircuitry model because it provides very well explanation of these three processes that relate to each other and that happens at the same time for everyone. Love it. That, Javier, I cannot thank you enough. I learned so much. And it does. I think it helps us, like what we were talking before, decrease the stigma in addiction and just allow us to provide more evidence-based and compassionate care to our patients. So thank you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ballister. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. Purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from the source. As each person is unique, you are advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.